All right, I think we're going to go and get started, everyone. Welcome to our annual CDCN Patient Summit. This is um, what we call our Super Bowl uh, uh, for, for all of us in the CDCN. For our, We've got at least one friend here from Ireland who's wearing green, and uh, the Super Bowl is our biggest uh, day of the year here in the, in the United States uh, in football, and, and here within the, the CDCN, it's certainly our biggest day of the year. It's um, so special to see so many familiar faces and um, and just as special to see so many new faces. So thank you guys for um, making the trip here. Um, and, and, and when I say thank you, it, it's because it means so much to us to be able to spend time with each of you. It means so much to us to be able to see you engaging with one another. Um, for our researchers, you'll get a chance to meet many of them over the course of the next today and tomorrow. And um, we dedicate our lives to trying to find treatments um, for each of you. And um, there are many in this room that are on drugs that are based on the research that we've done. And uh, I can't put it into word. I can't clear, clearly state to you just how special it is to see people like Tyla doing so well and others that are on drugs that are based on this research. It's what drives all of us. So um, so I hope that your time here, um, I hope you get a lot out of it, but I hope you also know that we get out a lot from just having you all here. So um, we've got a great uh, couple of days planned. Uh, my name's David Fagenbaum. I'm the co-founder and executive director, uh, or excuse me, I'm the co-founder and president of, of the Cast Music Cloud Network. We've recently, uh, and, and it's not all that recent, um, about three years ago, named an amazing uh, executive director for the CDCN, Mary Zaccato, who's in the back of the room. And we uh, just have an incredible team. Um, so um, it's an honor to be with you all today. Uh, and, and really, um, you know, we'll be together for the next couple of days. Um, a couple of notes that I wanted to go through um, uh, sort of before we get into all of our plans for the day. Um, the first is that um, we are going to share with you everything that we know about Castleman disease, everything we're doing in the lab, everything that are out in clinical guidelines. Um, but at the end of the day, this is all for informational purposes. Um, if there's any specific medical questions that you have, please do consult your doctor. Um, we'll have some doctors on site today, um, but it's hard for them to give full medical sort of guide, guidance and advice. So really, um, hopefully you'll learn a lot from these couple of days, but also if you don't have a doctor back home that is really experienced with this disease. I was chatting with someone this morning who said that every time they ask their doctor a question, the doctor turns to Google and asks Google the question. Um, and so if that's what it's like for you, talk to us. <laughs> um, we can help to find a doctor um, who, who knows more about the disease. Um, and so, uh, so hopefully um, we'll be able to give you a lot of information today. We'll also have um, some Q&A sessions. And again, um, would encourage during the Q&As um, to make the questions uh, a bit more general than um, specific. Obviously, ask any question that you'd like, but our answers are going to be a lot easier uh, and, and I think better if they're more general questions about the disease as opposed to, you know, I've had this happen. What would you do in my case? Um, and that'll, that'll just make it a little bit easier for our panelists. Um, we are doing a warrior flex competition. If any of you has, has ever met me before, you know that I love to do the Castleman flex. Um, and we as a team um, do the Castleman flex. And so um, we are going to be doing this competition where over the course of the next couple of days, if you take a picture doing the Castleman flex um, and you post it on social media with the hashtag uh, warrior flex, um, let's see, do we have it? Oh, yeah, there, type it in warrior flex with your image. Um, we will have a voting system um, within our team and we're gonna pick what we think is like the best warrior flex for the weekend. So doing it, getting some warrior flexes in, really important, uh, doing it in some sort of creative way, um, uh, anything you can think of to get a really good warrior flex, but it has to be posted to social media um, and we will, um, we will have a, a fierce competition, I'm sure. 
Um, so this is the agenda for um, for the day to day. Um, many of you all have been here before, and you know that we typically pack it. Um, in the past, we would start at 8 a.m. and we would go until 5 p.m. and everyone would be exhausted by the end of the day. And um, uh, we've We've heard your feedback. We appreciate your feedback. And so we've tried to make things maybe not as intensive um, starting at 10 a.m. this morning, going until about four, um, cutting back some of the hours of content. Um, I was so happy to hear about the event last night that so many of you all were able to get together with one another. Um, and that's, again, what this is all about, um, getting all of us together as a community to support, support one another. Any questions about the agenda or the plan for um, today? Great. All right. And feel free to raise your hand. I think there's there are some mics that, that we will be able to run around with questions. Feel free to raise your hand. We'll probably I'll probably try to march through most of this content um, as quickly as I can. Um, but if there's a burning question, raise your hand. We can address it as it comes up. If not, um, and you can hold it till the end, that might be easier. Um, and just we'll just go through a bunch of questions towards the end. Um, I will apologize for all of the Castleman disease patients in the room. Um, Fritz Van Rie, um, my co-founder for the CDCN um, and a, a dear friend, colleague, um, and, and also a friend of mine um, was supposed to be here for the Castleman, the IMCD session. Um, and Fritz had trouble with his flights yesterday. so. For the IMCD patients, I'm sorry, I'm going to be giving the IMCD sessions. So you have to hear, hear from me for like hours today. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, it would have been um, a nice distraction and break to, to hear from Fritz instead of me. Um, but uh, but I, I will um, take on Fritz's slides. Um, so uh, we always like to start every event um, and especially our patient summit by just recognizing um, the incredible people who help to, to and who do make these events um, as successful as they are. So um, before I, I, I show the, the slide with all of our team members, I did just want to do a really special round of applause for Maleva Rapaski and for Amber Cohen for all their really hard work on this. Just so amazing, um, put in so much hard work into this and, um, and it, it, you can tell that it's just been done so well so far. So of course, um, we have this amazing team between the CDCN and the CASEL, um, uh, which is the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory. Um, and as, as our team knows, it's not, it is not the CSTL, it is the CASEL, um, is what is the name of our organization. Um, uh, and those of you that have been to our summits from the very beginning, I saw Nick Driscoll here. Let's see, where's Nick? Where's Nick? There's Nick over there. Nick came to our very first patient summit, um, which we held back in um, 2014. And um, Nick will know that back in 2014, we had no employees, but we had a lot of fierce volunteers. Um, now we have a team of people that dedicate their lives to this. Um, and so we've really been able to just transition from this um, fierce group of volunteers who were working all day and all night, but as volunteers, um, to having this really amazing team of people. And so um, what I would really love is for any team members that are here today, um, that are in the audience, that are up on the screen, if you'll just stand up so we can do a round of applause, just thank you for everything you do. So we got Tracy's here, Mike's here. I guess everyone else is outside, is, is what, I, what I, I assume. Um, so they're all outside. But um, yeah, Maleva, will you just have some of them like come in and raise their hand? I mean, the good news is that like we're all wearing the same T-shirts, and so you should be able to tell um, who we are. But I just think it's our team is amazing, and they put in so many hours, and they work so hard. Yes, team, team, come through, and just just come on through, just run on in, and yeah, we're running in. Yeah, go team. Well. <laughs> So we've got incredible Chriswell and Bridget. So anyone who's done any sample um, contribution, you've worked with Bridget. If you've joined Accelerate, then you've worked with Chriswell at some point. Um, so again, we're still missing a lot of team members. I'm not sure where they all are. Um, oh, they're all eating. Okay, good. Okay, good. So they're eating. You'll see a lot more of our team members. They're all, all up on the screen. Thank you guys for representing the team. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> Another round of applause for Chriswell and Bridget. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we, yeah, come on in. We're, we're trying to just, we just want to cheer for our CDCN team members. Yeah, so this is Sally. Sally is our new, um, our new chief of staff, biomedical leadership fellow. Sal, <laughs> we don't need to interrupt people's breakfast. I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Sally. So Sally is taking a year off from medical school. Um, 
you you all will remember um, many former um, uh, biomedic leadership fellows, so people like Helen Partridge, um, uh, like Alexis Phillips, Dale Cobrin, and now we have the amazing um, Sally, um, who they, they take an entire year off from medical school at Penn and they dedicate their time. Oh yeah, nice. Okay, we got more of the team. See, they're not just in the pictures, like they, they, they are real. Go team. Sorry to interrupt your breakfast, um, but I just wanted I just wanted to like recognize these people. Uh, you know, I was I was telling the team or, or the attendees earlier that um, you know when we first started holding this, it was all volunteers, and um, we have the most amazing team in the world. These are actually just a few of, of the amazing team members. If you're if you've joined Accelerate, then you then you your records have probably been reviewed by Mateo. Mateo goes meticulously through patient medical records, enters um, literally thousands of data points on each of you on each of your cases. If you've given us a blood sample, then Abiola might have worked with your blood before. Abiola works in the lab and has been doing some really, really exciting experiments. If you've seen any social media posts recently, then Brent um, likely had his hand in those social media posts. I've told you guys about Sally. Who, she just joined us about two weeks ago, and I don't think I've ever seen anyone uh, produce this much in two weeks before, so we're, we're off to a really good start. Um, uh, if you also have joined Accelerate, um, we've got the amazing Sai who works alongside Mateo to enter in, like I said, thousands of data points. And finally, Ira, who works alongside Abiola in the wet lab performing experiments on biospecimens. So um, if you've ever joined our registry or given a blood sample, um, then you've likely, uh, your case has been reviewed and your samples have been worked with by our team. So thanks guys for coming in. Sorry to interrupt your breakfast. <laughs> And there's a there's a, a a picture missing from this screen, and that's um, someone that we hold very near and dear to our hearts. Um, if any of you all have come to our events, you've probably interacted with Sheila Pearson. Sheila uh, was our fearless leader for the registry for the last seven years, and um, our registry uh, has really transformed the diagnosis and treatment of Castleman disease. We've learned so much from it, thanks to Sheila's leadership. Sheila um, just started medical school down the street at Temple University, and so I don't think that she's watching right now, but I think we should still cheer for her, um, for Sheila. Um, we're so happy. She's going to be the most amazing doctor. Um, but so anyway, these are our, our team members um, who dedicate all their time um, to this disease. And um, again, so happy that, uh, that we've got such a great crew. So I, I mentioned some of our early um, patient summits. And um, I mentioned Nick. You can see Nick on the bottom. Nick is kneeling in our picture. We didn't have enough chairs back then. We were, we were resource constrained back in the early days. We only had so many chairs in the room. Um, uh, but we've really grown so much. Um, and you can see sort of year to year, we got more chairs and uh, more, more and more chairs um yeah and we you know we've just grown so much over these years of course we had to take a couple years to be virtual and um and then it was so great to be back in person um last year um i did also want to call out um a couple photos or a couple people in photos i just saw um and that's the board of directors for the cdcn um they're sort of behind the scenes you don't um, you know, see them. They're not the ones that um, that we, uh, you know, interact with your data and your samples, but they help to make this organization work and do all the great work that it does. And um, Greg Pacheco and Michael Steif are two um, of our leaders on the board. Greg is the chair of the board. Michael is the treasurer. Um, and so if you've done any sort of reimbursements or connect, gone down, this, down the hall, you would have seen the two of them. They're going to be here um, today and tomorrow. So um, major thank you to the whole board of directors, but in particular to those two that are here today. So go out of your way to give them a hug and thank them for, for the work that they do. But And maybe we'll cheer loud enough for them to hear us too. All right, so um, during this um, first welcome session, um, just did just want to um, share my personal journey briefly um, of, uh, uh, like those of you in the room that have Castleman disease, um, I was totally healthy before I got Castleman's, and then as a 25-year-old, I became critically ill. All of my organs started to shut down. Um, I spent weeks and weeks in the intensive care unit, uh, lost consciousness, had a, a temporary blindness in my left eye um, and uh, and didn't think that I would survive. And I know that that um, rings um, very true for so many of you. Um, it took 11 weeks to get the diagnosis in my case. And it was sort of in the, the last possible moment the diagnosis was made. Um, and if it really had been much longer, I don't think that I would be here today. Um, but you can imagine that this experience of um, 
you know, taking so long to get a diagnosis and such a challenge has just inspired me and inspires our team to continue to try to change the way things are so that other patients don't have to go through this. So I was finally diagnosed with idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease and I was a third year med student at the time and I'd never heard of Castleman disease, um, uh, even as a medical student, um, before hearing it uh, from my doctor. And um, as you know, getting the diagnosis is almost just the start of the journey. Um, you're like, oh great, I have an answer, and like, I'm gonna get figured out. And then you're like, oh my gosh, there's so many more questions about my disease um, than there are answers. But the good news is, is there's, I guess, a lot more answers over the last um, 13 years than there were um, back when I first got sick. Um, but with the diagnosis came a lot of treatment. Um, I got IL-6 blockade, which unfortunately did not work in my particular case, um, which meant that I needed a lot of chemotherapy, um, which did work, but brought with it a lot of the challenges that chemotherapy brings with it. I felt really unwell, lost all my hair, um, and unfortunately would have a number of relapses. Um, of course, you can see pictures of me um, looking very, very unwell. Um, Thankfully, uh, I had the most amazing support in the world. So um, I love that so many loved ones um, are here with patients because uh, it's such a journey that we all go on together. Um, I remember uh, one of the last days that I was in the hospital um, during the first six months that I was hospitalized. And I, I told, or my nurse asked me, said, oh my gosh, you must be so excited. You're finally getting discharged. And I said, I know I've been hospitalized for almost six months, I can't wait to, to get out of here. And my dad looked at me and he said, what is this, I've been hospitalized, we've been hospitalized <laughs> for six months. And it's true, he actually spent every night in the hospital with me for those six months on, on those pull-out couches. Um, and, uh, and he just never left my side. And that was so important in my journey. So, um, so maybe a round of applause for all the loved ones that are in here today. Thank, thank you for, for everything you guys do. Um, of course, uh, it's, it's just amazing. It's just completely amazing. Um, so I love the picture on the left um, for a couple reasons. Um, uh, one of them is that it's got my in, incredible wife, Caitlin, on one side. She um, also never left my side. Um, she has been just such an incredible support for me throughout this whole journey. And she, in this picture, represents to me this the importance of having support, um, whether it's a significant other or a parent or a sibling or a child, but really the importance of having that support on, on one side. And on my other side in that picture, I've got a, a, a pack uh, or a, over my shoulder and it's got um, a pump that's pumping in a drug into my port. Um, so I'm sure, I think some of you all have ports. I think there's even someone who's named their port. At least, yes, you've named your port. Um, is it Porsche? Was that what it was? Porsche, that's right. But I thought I remembered that. Um, so, um, you know, I'm getting in this particular picture, I'm getting um, an infusion uh, of a drug into my port. And um, it represents to me science and technology sort of keeping me alive. And so in the same picture, you've got on one side science, medicine, technology that's like, you know, pumping into my veins literally to keep me alive. And the other side, I've got my incredible, at the time, girlfriend, now wife, supporting me. And I think those are two of the ingredients that have really um, led to um, what's now been a long journey with this disease, um, but thus far, um, a positive one. And, and I think the third ingredient um, is the CDCN and the amazing team that's here, people like Mary Zaccato um, and others that make the CDCN do the special work that it does. So for me, it's a combination of support and love um, for my loved ones, medicine, technology, and then this amazing team um, that's doing such great work. And um, that's helped me get through a lot of relapses. So um, this is a picture of me from one of my relapses. I've had a total of five um, deadly flares with this disease. Um, but thankfully, um, those five deadly flares all occurred in the first three and a half years that I had this disease. And it's now been nine and a half years um, that I've been doing great on this drug. And, uh, and oh, thank you. Thank you. And other patients in this room are on that drug and, um, and others that we've, we've been able to be a part of. Um, so just, it's, it's so special. So I wanna share a bit of a history um, about Castleman disease. It, um, of course, Castleman's has been around forever, but it was back in 1954 that Benjamin Castleman first described what's now called Castleman disease. He looked at a bunch of lymph nodes that he thought were from patients with lymphoma, and it turned out um, that they didn't have lymphoma, and they all looked kind of similar when he looked under the microscope. Um, and that disease that he described back then is now called Castleman disease. Um, it took about 20 years before it was clear that there were two subtypes of Castleman's. So for 
20 years, um, they were sort of all getting combined together and pretty much everyone was getting chemotherapy and then it became clear that there's a unicentric and a multicentric subtype. Um, and then back another, really another 20 years um, before Kazu Yoshizaki um, discovered that interleukin-6 is really important in most cases of multicentric Castleman disease. Um, Kazu has become a dear friend of mine. You can see him doing the Castleman flex in this picture. Um, I had to tell a quick story, which some of you all will already know. I'm sure Penny uh, could finish my story for me. But um, Kazu, uh, he discovered that interleukin-6 was really important in Castleman disease back in the 80s. Um, and when he discovered that IL-6 was important, he also went on to discover and develop a drug for it that blocks the interleukin-6 receptor. And um, I had heard that he gave it to himself as the first patient to ever take tocilizumab. So I asked him, I said, Kazu, Makoto just told me that you discovered IL-6 was important, you developed the drug, and then you gave it to yourself as the first human ever. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't give it to myself. The nurse, the nurse gave it to me. <laughs> said, Kazu, that's crazy. So, um, so Kazu was the first human to ever receive the exact drug that he developed. Um, and when he didn't die from the drug. Um, he went on to study it in Castleman disease patients in Japan. It got an approval in Japan for Castleman disease. And then the drug company that acquired it brought it to the United States where it got, it got approval for rheumatoid arthritis. That drug, Actemra or tocilizumab, never got approval in the US for Castleman disease because that particular company wasn't interested in such a rare disease. But then that served as sort of the inspiration for the development of siltuximab. So whereas tocilizumab blocks the receptor for IL-6, siltuximab blocks IL-6 directly, and that led to the development and then the eventual approval of siltuximab, which I know a number of patients here today are on that drug. So as I mentioned, tocilizumab went on to get an approval in Japan um, after Katsu developed it and tested it on himself. And then um, uh, in 2012 is when we started the CDCN. And uh, I mentioned I co-founded it with uh, Dr. Fritz Van Rie. And when we founded it, we really felt like there were two things that we wanted to do very differently from the way things were being done. Um, the first is that we didn't, so most rare disease groups will raise money and then you invite researchers to apply to use the money how they think it should be used. And unfortunately, that process results in a lot of sort of waiting and hoping that the right researcher applies for the right project at the right time. And I don't know about you, but I don't have time to wait for all those stars to align. Um, and so we said, what if instead of doing that, what if we reach out to the physician, researcher, and patient communities and understand from them, from all of you, what's important for our disease, and then go figure out who's the best person in the world to actually do that research. Um, it just made total sense, even if they've never done Castleman's research before, let's figure out what should be done and let's go get people to do it. Um, and we call that the collaborative network approach. And then the second thing we were going to do differently is we were going to focus um, really intensively on identifying existing FDA approved drugs to see if we could repurpose them for Castleman disease. Um, and that was sort of a, a crazy concept back then. Um, it was, well, wait a minute, if you have a rare disease, you need to better understand the disease and then you need to find a drug for that disease. Um, but again, we don't have time for that, right? Um, you know, what, what we had time for was drugs that were already in the pharmacy that had already been developed for something else to see if maybe they could help us right away as opposed to waiting for a new drug to be developed. So those are really the two founding principles. Um, so where were we back in 2012? Well, um, there was about $10,000 a year being raised and spent on Castleman disease research um, total uh, worldwide. The NIH had never funded Castleman's research before. Um, there were no patients in a registry because we didn't have a registry back then. Um, there were two amazing organizations that existed, ICDO and CARE. Um, some of you all um, may remember those two organizations um, doing a lot of important advocacy work and supporting patients with their journeys. Um, but there was no sort of uh, collaborative research infrastructure in place. Um, there were no cell lines, no animal models, no biobanks. Um, there were a lot of questions um, that were unknown. Um, there were no diagnostic criteria. So when I was diagnosed, um, there wasn't a checklist for the doctor to say, oh, you do or don't have Castleman disease. You just had to hope that some pathologist had seen Castleman's before and would recognize it. Um, and again, uh, we, we like to, uh, something I say a lot, we like to go from hope to action. So, you know, let's not just hope that there's a criteria, let's develop a criteria so that patients can benefit. Um, 
there were no treatment guidelines. Um, there were no blood tests to predict whether a drug could work for one disease or another. Um, there were no FDA approved therapies, um, but there was one drug in development, that drug siltuximab that I mentioned that was being studied here in the US. And many of you all are on that drug, but it had not yet been approved. So with all that in mind, um, we launched the CDCN with this goal of accelerating research and treatment for Castleman disease through those two really innovative ways that I mentioned, where we actually work with the whole community to prioritize research, and we focus really heavily on repurposing existing drugs that are already approved for something else so we can get them to patients really rapidly. Um, so we, we perform immunology research, we crowdsource and collaborate with uh, members across the world. Um, we raise awareness and, and funds for our research, and then we have really championed this innovative um, drug repurposing approach. And I, the very bottom of the screen, I think, is really important, and that's highlighting the vision for the world that we're working together. And that's a world where every single Castleman's patient can live a full life in quality and quantity. And we've been able, able to make a lot of progress over the last 12 years. Um, we've the data is, is is complicated and challenging, but we have been able to improve outcomes for patients, overall survival rate, and what you can expect um, in terms of time between relapses. But we've still got work ahead of us, and we're going to continue to push. And we're able to connect the physician community. These are some dots representing physicians that are part of our network. And this image is, is a little old, actually. I think there's a, there's a lot more dots these days. Um, these are some of our, our doctors doing the Castleman Flex. Uh, we've connected this amazing patient community. Uh, many of you all are represented with the pins. I think this is also an old image. There's probably a lot more pins, um, but here we are together last year. Um, and and where are we today? So um, over the last year, 11 years, we've made a lot of progress. Um, so we've um, raised and spent about $2.1 million on life-saving research from the CDCN, which obviously is um, a lot more than was being spent before, and it's thanks to many people in this room who have put on events. Um, just hearing this morning about um, a fundraiser that didn't involve even putting on an event, it just involved handing out letters to, to coworkers and to, to friends and family, and those sorts of things add up, and they have added up. They've added up to over $2 million that we've been able to spend on research, but really importantly, that $2 million has led to enough breakthroughs and enough progress that we've been able to get other groups to invest $16 million into Castleman's research. So though we worked as hard as we possibly could to raise those $2 million, I could not have raised any more than those $2 million. We've spent them so wisely that other groups like the NIH and the FDA have put money into what we're doing. So now we've been able to do over $18 million worth of research, um, which is again, just a testament to uh, how hard our team has been working, a testament to the samples and the data that you all have contributed, because you can't do research if you don't have samples and data. Um, and, and I think just a testament to the, to the major unmet need here. Um, another number on the screen um, that I'm very proud of is that our approach to research um, has become a model for how other rare diseases can do research. And um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, which was founded by, um, by the founders of Facebook, they have spent $27 million giving money to other rare disease groups for them to replicate what we've done for Castleman disease. Now, I would have loved for some of that to come to Castleman's, um, but, uh, but I'm honestly so thankful to know that money is going to all these other rare disease groups for them to follow the model that we've taken and um and just so excited to think about okay the work we're doing here isn't isn't only for castleman disease but the work we're doing here is inspiring work um, really across rare diseases so we got the first ever nih funded study um, about five years ago and we got that renewed recently so the second ever nih funded study um, and also the first ever fda funded study um, which was funded about a year ago We've got over 1,800 patients in our contact registry, um, which is basically our really limited registry we have on the CDCN website. Um, our more extensive registry, Accelerate, we've had over 1,000 patients start the process of enrolling into Accelerate, and I think our total number is over 600, maybe closing in on 700 patients that have fully completed the process. So if you're part of the 300 or 400 that started to join Accelerate, but you haven't finished yet, I hope you'll do that. Um, uh, and he'll help us to keep getting our numbers up. Um, every one of you that has enrolled, um, we've literally had a full-time person spend like weeks going through your records and we've learned so much, so, so thank you. Um, we went from there being two organizations before the CDCN to now all coming together into one collaborative network, um, which I think has been so critical for our progress. We've got a unified research agenda. We've got a biobank that many of you all have given blood samples towards. Um, we've made progress, though there's still a lot of work to be done. 
Um, we now have diagnostic criteria for both IMCD and for UCD. Um, developing those criteria um, were game changers. And um, anyone who's been diagnosed after 2017, um, almost certainly your doctor looked at this checklist, they looked at the images, um, and they said, I think this is Castleman's. Um, and, uh, and probably for most of you, it happened before it would have happened if those guidelines didn't exist. Um, we also have treatment guidelines for UCD and for IMCD, so that way when the doctor finally makes the diagnosis, they actually have a checklist of what can I do first, what should I do second, third, and fourth, it's based on evidence, um, as opposed to before, it was sort of random, you know, is your doctor familiar with this drug or that drug, um, and, uh, and obviously we've got important work to do, but this was a major step for us. We also have two blood tests that you can run. They can predict whether one drug is likely to work or another. Both of those blood tests are what I would call research grade right now, which means we publish them in a scientific journal, but there isn't a way to send the blood to a lab yet. We're hopefully gonna get these to become clinical grade at some point soon, um, but they can help to predict whether siltuximab is likely to work for you or not. Um, now there's an FDA approved therapy, that drug siltuximab that I mentioned earlier, um, went on to get FDA approval. And we've got three more drugs in development that we're really focused on. And, and again, we will not stop until there's a drug for every one of us. And there's and every one of us lives a full, full life, again, in quality and quantity. So we don't want to find drugs that you know, lower your quality of life. We want to find drugs that are going to help you to achieve full length and also full quality of life. Um, this is a listing of the drugs that the CDCN has either identified or advanced in some way along this uh, sort of pipeline. And so you can see there's a number of drugs that I would say sort of early stage that we discovered something in the lab that made us think that that drug might be useful for Castleman disease all the way through drugs that have, been, have made more progress. And you can see um, some of the scientific papers that we've written um, uh, highlighting this. And again, we've, we've been around as an organization for about 11 years and the idea that we've had you know, a track record of more than one new treatment discovery um, every year for that period um, is just something that I never could have imagined um, when we started the CDCN. Um, it was sort of, when Fritz and I started it, it was sort of, um, you know, this disease is gonna take my life at some point in the next few months and I'm gonna do everything I can to go out swinging. And it was like, I'm just gonna, any any connection I can get on the castle man um, would be a victory, but but certainly never imagined that, that we'd make, make so much progress. So uh, more recently, um, uh, I've been thinking a lot uh, about how do we spread what we've done uh, and how do we take the learnings from Chasing My Cure. Um, and of course, the last 10 years have been all about going from Chasing My Cure to Chasing Our Collective Cures. Um, and then more recently launched an organization called Every Cure, um, which is uh, on a mission to unlock the full potential of existing medicines. So I mentioned earlier the drug that's saving my life um, was on the pharmacy shelf, was made for another disease, had never been used for Castleman's, um, and it has been a lifesaver for me. And so I'm sure the same thing for many of you, but I'm sitting here, I'm like, I'm alive because of a drug that wasn't made for my disease, so I'm really not supposed to be here right now. And then, wait a minute, how many more drugs are sitting at the pharmacy that could help other people? And, and maybe they're not surviving because someone hasn't figured out the extra use and the additional uses for those drugs. So um, more recently with the launch of this nonprofit, Every Cure, um, we've been able to, to really focus on unlocking additional uses for existing medicines. Um, so every cure, as I mentioned, on this, on this mission to unlock additional uses for approved medicines, so that way every drug that's at your CVS is used for every disease it can possibly treat, and not just the one or two that were initially um, intended for that drug. Um, do it uh, through a few ways. The first is um, utilizing um, really exciting new technologies um, uh, called machine learning, um, which is a subfield of artificial intelligence, to try to identify and predict new uses for drugs, even if no one's ever thought about that before. Um, as well as bringing together uh, you know, these insights into running clinical trials, um, and then finally making sure that the drugs are equitably accessible to patients all around the world. So um, I'm really excited about Every Cure for a number of reasons. One, of course, is the broader impact um, that we can make through Every Cure, but also specifically its impact in Castleman disease. Um, so uh, some of you all may have seen one of our um, uh, uh, I guess a story that we re recently ran about um, a drug that we used for the first time ever in a, ca in a Castleman disease patient. It turns out that that artificial intelligence algorithm predicted it as the most promising new treatment for Castleman disease. And so that sort of ability to utilize the tools that we're building through every cure but apply them directly to Castleman's is really, really exciting. Um, 
it's also helped us to raise a lot of international awareness about Castleman disease. Um, if you follow us on social media, you will know that um, I've been sort of all over the world over the last year, um, trying to raise awareness about what we're doing and in the process have informed a lot of people about Castleman disease. And, and so it's sort of the process of sharing about every cure has helped to raise awareness for Castleman's um, and also gotten us in the room with a lot of um, really great healthcare leaders that get Castleman's on the map. So um, in just wrapping up this first session um, to highlight how we think about the summit, we think about it the same way as we think about your journey with Castleman's. So sort of starting out with, I'm sure you all asked the question when your doctor walked in and said, you have Castleman disease. You probably said, what is Castleman disease? Um, so that's how, we're, that's how we start out the summit. What is Castleman disease? Um, we talk about getting the diagnosis of Castleman's, what you need to be sure or confident that you have the diagnosis. Um, next step is finding the right doctor. Sometimes the doctor near you is the perfect doctor for you. Sometimes you need to drive somewhere um, to go see the right doctor. Sometimes you need to fly somewhere. Um, we'll talk about finding the right therapy. Um, you know, you want to get to the right doctor so you can understand what's the right treatment approach. Um, next step is how do you manage your symptoms? Um, the goal for all of us, again, is full disease control. That's what we should all be working towards. If any of us have any Castleman disease related symptoms, then that is something that we should be thinking about how do we manage them. Castleman's is a horrible disease and there are some of us, there are many of us, where the drugs we're on don't fully control all of your symptoms, but we should still be fighting towards a future for all of us where all of those symptoms are under control. So, so we want to talk about managing symptoms. We're going to talk about living with Castleman disease. It's really scary to live with a disease like Castleman disease. None of us wanted to have this or want to have this disease. And so hopefully we can share with one another about how we, you know, each deal with having a disease like Castleman's. Um, and then we sort of close with how do we fight back? Um, and some of you all from the very beginning, I, I see Gary here, um, he started fighting against Castleman disease the day he was diagnosed with Castleman's. Um, poor Gary, when I went to see him in the ICU at Penn, um, I came uh, and I gave him a hug, of course, meeting him and his wife. And then I pulled tubes, empty tubes for blood draws out of my pocket. And so, so poor guy, um, I didn't, didn't get much beyond, hello, my name is David, before I was like, we give us some blood, Gary, um, uh, and, and Gary very kindly and generously donated his blood. I think you, re, you did some math. What do you think your total amount of blood that you've given? Two liters. Uh, that's not milliliters. That's in li that's liters. So Two thousand milliliters of blood, um, and that's because Gary's been doing so well for so long. And um, and those blood samples have really been transformative because um, it's very unusual um, to to get a blood sample from a patient before they're started on treatment because, you know, as soon as we get diagnosed, we want to get on treatment right away. Um, in Gary's case, because he was at Penn and he hadn't gotten treatment and he wasn't going to get it for a couple hours, we could get his blood sample before the treatment started. And there's a few other patients where we've been able to, but once someone gets started on treatment, then that affects the results of these blood tests that we do and the work that we do in the lab. They're very sensitive to any change. So Gary's case in particular has really um, made a big difference for our understanding of Castleman. So, um, Let's see, uh, we are right up to um, this next session. Let me see really quick, schedule wise. Okay, we're gonna have to go five, we're gonna have to go a little bit into the break. Um, thank you, Dane. I got a, 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 a warning in the back. Um, so we wanna talk about Castleman disease. What is Castleman disease? Um, well, it's a group of diseases that share a common appearance under the microscope. Um, I've mentioned UCD and MCD. Um, Every one of you in this room, I hope, has a good sense for what subtype of Castleman disease you have. Um, there are at least two subtypes of multicentric Castleman disease. One is driven by a virus called human herpes virus 8. The other one, we don't know what causes it. We call that idiopathic multicentric Castleman's. And there's actually even a third one that's driven by a, a clonal cancerous population um, called Poem syndrome. So it's really, really important that if you have Castleman's that you know what your subtype is. Um, and I'm going to go through this really quickly, um, uh, but just to highlight, what does the immune system do? I think all of us have a good sense, especially over the last few years with the pandemic, getting a sense for, you know, the, the goal of the immune system is to be in a watchful, uh, in a waiting mode to see if there's some sort of pathogen, cancer, something that it needs to fight. Um, and then once it sees that, it turns itself on, it attacks that thing, and then it goes back into a watchful waiting mode and it, it sort of calms down. So, so if you were to use this firefighter analogy, you know, you've got a firefighter in a surveillance mode, they learn about a fire, they go to the fire to put out the fire, they eliminate it, and they go back into their, into their surveillance mode. In Castleman disease, if you use the same firefighter analogy, 
um, the firefighter goes into a fight mode, even though there isn't necessarily a fire to fight. So sort of, we don't know why, but it turns on, the immune system turns on and starts trying to fight fires when there aren't fires. And in doing so, cause a lot of collateral damage, um, which affects the good things like your vital organs, like your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, your liver, um, and cause a lot of problems. And then also a problem is that it doesn't stop. It's relentless. And so you can imagine the equivalent of the firefighter would be that you flood the whole city trying to put out a fire that doesn't even exist. Um, and you cause a lot of problems along the way. We've got a lot of work to do to still understand what causes idiopathic multicentric calcium disease and unicentric calcium disease. But there's something that turns on the immune system. And then, and there's a variety of immune cells that are turned on, a variety of uh, pathways um, that are turned on, and of course, um, a number of clinical issues that patients face. So this is another slide just to highlight that um, sometimes you'll hear people talk about, I want to boost my immune system. Um, uh, and I typically say, don't boost your immune system. I, I have a boosted immune system and it causes problems. Um, what you really want is you want a balanced immune system um, because on one side, if your immune system is too weak, then you're at risk of infections and at risk of not being able to surveil against cancer. Um, over the course of, of our lifetimes, whether you have Castleman's or not, um, you will develop cancerous cell populations in your body and your immune system will actually destroy those populations and you will never even know that you had cancer. But if your immune system is really weak, then when those cancerous populations emerge, your immune system isn't able to eliminate them and you develop cancer. Um, also, of course, we know about what happens with viruses if you have a weak immune system. So obviously you don't want to have too weak of an immune system, but you also don't want to have too strong of an immune system because Castleman's is what happens when your immune system is too strong. Um, so you really want to have that, that balance. And for some of us on this balance, um, like someone like me with, with my Castleman disease, my immune system is too strong, and so I need to take medication to weaken the immune system. And that's the drug I take, serolimus. It actually weakens my immune system and getting it closer to a balance. You all know the symptoms all too well because you've experienced them. Um, for, in terms of diagnosing, again, I know that you've all gone through the diagnostic process. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but um, as you all know, the first step is really a lymph node biopsy. And um, if you haven't had a lymph node biopsy, and your doctor tells you you have Castleman disease, it's really important that someone gets a lymph node biopsy. Because Castleman disease is sometimes called the great mimicker because it can demonstrate features that are similar to a lot of other diseases. And so you really wanna make sure there's a lymph node taken out so you can be sure it's Castleman's. Uh, and um, I hope that you'll go by and check out the microscope. One of our, our scientific leads, uh, Melanie Mumau, she set up a few different uh, lymph nodes to look out under the microscope and you get a guess which one's the Castleman's lymph node, which one's not. I told Melanie that it was really high stakes pressure for me when I went to look at it. I was like, what if I get it wrong? Um, thankfully, I got it right. I was like really, really happy about that because it's that complicated. I mean, I've looked at thousands of lymph nodes and it's still like, gosh, they, they really look quite similar. And so um, I hope you all will take a look over there. Um, I think we're going to have some sort of game for who, who gets our, our prize for who gets it right. Um, so there's particular features in the lymph node that you need to see. Um, just to tell you how complicated it is, um, the world's leading expert for lymph node pathology, her name's Elaine Jaffe. Um, her handle on Twitter is Heme Machine, just to give you a sense for like, um, for who she is. Um, she explained to me early on in my journey with Castleman's that distinguishing Castleman's versus not Castleman's is like looking at a Van Gogh or a Monet painting. And that like, I was like, what do you mean here? Like, you know, break it down for me. And, and she's like, well, I can't really tell you why it's a Monet or Van Gogh, but you can just kind of tell when you look at it. I was like, that is not helpful at all for Castleman's. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna need you to give me some more specifics. So I eventually pulled out some specifics. Well, the germinal centers are smaller, the mantle zones are bigger, got some details. And so we have criteria for what you should look for. But the point is it's quite subtle. It's like, you know, it looks like this or it doesn't look like that. So anyway, I hope everyone will take a look under the microscope um, to see if you can guess, guess what's a lymph. And so this is our criteria. We have very specific features that they need to be looking for. But again, it's not always that clear. Um, and so here uh, is there's a photo uh, on the top of a lymph node and, and also on the bottom. Anyone want to like raise, raise your hand if you think that the bottom lymph node is Castleman disease? Any, any guesses that that's Castleman's? All right, any guesses that the top one's Castleman disease? Well, you guys did great. So the top one is Castleman's, and I, I don't know if I, 
<laughs> oh, that's right. You come to the summit before. Okay. So it's the same, I need to uh, clean up my slides. Um, but yeah, so, so the point here is that there's really subtle differences. And it's not the shade. The shade has to do with um, uh, the concentration of, of the stain. But it's really there's these very subtle differences in Castleman's. You can't point to a lymph and say, this is why it's Castleman's. You have to look at the whole thing. Remember, like the Van Gogh versus the Monet and say, oh, it looks generally like Castleman's. So of course, next step is finding an expert physician. Reach out to us. If you feel like your doctor doesn't really, 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 really know Castleman's, please reach out to us so we can find someone who does for you. Um, let's see. I think the last one I just want to highlight is that even with the best doctors in the world, CD is still a very difficult diagnosis to make. And so it can be really frustrating. You can go see the world's expert, and they can say, I think it's probably Castleman's. You're like, hey, probably. <laughs> what do you mean probably? And and that's that's really sort of the best we can do is that it's probably Castleman disease because it's a really hard diagnosis. Um, so from an imaging perspective, um, you need to get either a PET scan or some sort of whole body imaging to determine whether you have unicentric or multicentric disease. Um, unicentric, of course, one region, multicentric, multiple regions. But some cases fall into what we call regional Castleman's, sort of fall in between, where it's maybe two neighboring regions. Um, so it kind of looks like multicentric because it's more than one, but it behaves a lot more like unicentric because it's only two. Um, of course, there's a number of lab tests that can be abnormal. Again, you all know what can be abnormal because you've seen the test. It's also important to um, emphasize that Castleman disease is pretty consistent, which means that um, however you present it early on is going to be typically how you'll represent if you have a relapse. So um, whatever the blood tests were, whatever the symptoms were that happened early would be the symptoms and the blood abnormalities you expect later on. It doesn't typically progress into like much more severe later on than it was earlier or much less severe. It's pretty consistent, um, which is different from a lot of cancers in particular. Um, you got to rule out a lot of diseases that can look like Castleman disease um, when you make the diagnosis. And then it's really important to determine your subtype of MCD. So you want to make sure you know whether the, the patient is HHV positive or negative. Um, you want to make sure you know if someone has POEM syndrome, the monoclonal plasma cell population. And finally, if they have idiopathic MCD, because this is going to change how you treat the patient. All right, I'm going to skip over this to say we have the criteria um, uh, between both of them. Okay, great. So. Um, that gets us to our break, which means I didn't leave any time for questions. I apologize for that. Um, but what I can say is that we have this Q&A panel from 1 to 2.30 this afternoon that I'll be a part of. And so any questions that are on your mind right now, please write them down. And then um, during the hour and a half long panel, be sure that you ask them. So thank you guys all so much. Thank you. We'll be back here in about 10 minutes.